when announcements. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> I remember you saying uh, announcements. Good. Um, looking to be married. About the the um, hot cross buns. Yes, that's on my list. I'm gonna let um, Glennis go yeah, first, okay. and then I will. Anyway, I've got a quite a list here of announcements. Just in the back of my mind to tell you, and I've been forgetting. Kristen Stewart is. Good morning. I first want to thank everyone. Oh, okay. And I don't even know what, what has she been doing for Palm Sunday. I heard that a few people felt okay. that a little bit of a pain. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope you did find ways to enjoy it. And um, I have okay. a okay. new request I'm for next week for Zoom Easter. Church. I would <laughs> like to ask that you bring in any stuffed animals that um, might have a little love story um, behind them. Yeah, I, and I have I several am. of these baskets you with know, some pastel too. color cloth so that we'll be able to work in with our beautiful quakers. Easter but plants. Is going on in the and if it's not too right late, now, it would be great to I have people that dedicate and order plants, yeah, tulips, hyacinths, and lilies. Tulips, um, no, well, not hyacinths. So, uh, Hydrangea, azalea, I think, either way, I'll get to it. Yep. Um, so you can do that if you care to. And then after the service, you'll be able to take your stuffed animals and plants that you all of you. But I, I also wanted to mention while I was on the subject of the stuffed animals, I was thinking about the love and the symbolism that they contain. Oh, and I started that? thinking about the story of the Velveteen Rabbit. Mm -hmm. And it has been a hundred years since this story was written. Well, anyway, I mean, this and is the many illustrators and other authors have made different versions of the Velveteen Rabbit and so book. I think and it, I it is a story that talks about what how to receive and give and love and so how to get real. And I think so a lot of us right take now, most of our lifetimes to finally figure out what really matters and how to really get real. So um, in my search about the Velveteen Rabbit, I discovered that there's a new edition coming out on April 12th. And I ordered it, so I'm very eager to see how another artist has interpreted the same wonderful story. Um, that isn't true. And that's something we all enjoy hearing yeah, no, music and stories, certainly, Bible stories or you know, interpretations of, of it's gonna be wonderful stories of love. So when we bring our stuffed animals in, that's what I hope the, the children and each other can share anyway, for me, with others know, what, what love what these stuffed really animals will to me is this symbolize for you in your life. Of course that Thank I'm you. That and for those online, if um, you won't be able to bring a stuffed animal in, um, then you can um, just show it on your on the screen with you. Have it sit next to you or something like that. So uh, um, that's great. I'm seeing some comments. Um, can did ever, did everyone online hear Glennis? Is that mic picking up? No, kind of. Jessica, I see Jessica going. Not really. Okay, Tom, this one's not picking up well. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. All right, we'll get that fixed. So um, the question, I can be heard though, right? Is that one? Okay, that one's picking up. Thanks, Jessica, for also being our, um, <laughs> our audio person today. So um, I want to say thank you to the chicken pie people. Um, I understand it was like 100 servings or something. Is that right? Quite a few? Close to 100. So um, just when we think that um, everybody's ready for spring and doesn't want comfort food, they all want their, their last chicken pie dinner of the season. So thank you to everyone. And I heard it was a great time down there too, just chatting and cooking and um, getting together. So how wonderful. Um, thank you. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Um, we do have hot cross buns today after for, for coffee hour, and they're also doing them if you'd like to donate toward them. Um, they're using that as a, as a fundraiser for the um, Deacons Fund, and the Deacons Fund is the fund that we use to um, support people here in Gorham. That's the fund, like when I talked about a couple of weeks ago, that we um, pulled money so that somebody could get 100 gallons of heating oil. That's what that fund comes from, um, or that's what comes from that fund. So if you'd like to do that. And as we said, um, Easter plants are still available. You can do it online. 
Um, you also, there are forms at all the entrances here if you'd like to do that instead. Lilies, tulips, and hydrangeas. And if I read my notes, I actually know what's going on. Um, so you're welcome to do that. There is an Easter egg hunt um, next Sunday at 9 a.m. for the kids here. The um, just a, yeah, I'm going to go through the announcements because we haven't done this in a while. Nothing. Um, no, I'm muted. The 27th of April, we no, have no, no, Requiem we'll for an care. electric chair. I think okay. this is they, the third time it's gotten scheduled, and it looks like it's going to be a go. So if you'd like to go with this, it's at the Westbrook Performance Center, and you can buy your tickets know. online. And we'll do a talk back about this. We'll do a discussion. I'm going to go and, and and if anybody else has got tickets and is going, please let me know so I know who all's going. Okay. Um, there were no bulk ticket prices, so everybody kind of needs to get turned on. Um, Beyond Worship, the book club update is that on the 24th of April, we're going to do On Tyranny by Tim Snyder. I didn't leave my computer when I was gone, so we couldn't do it last time. Um, but in your bulletin and in the blast are the next two books. And... Um, uh, they're also re-upping kind of the young, the former Young at Heart program to do a, pot a potluck luncheon um, for anybody who wants to come. And that's on Tuesday, May 3 um, at noon. So check your bulletin and your blast for that. And finally, I think one announcement I don't have in there is I had gotten a grant probably almost a year ago now, um, but with COVID it a bit of a problem to do an art project here in Gorham. And um, we are going to, <laughs> we're going to project art that people have lived with um, and either made or had in their homes during COVID. We're calling it inside out so that art you have inside, bring it outside. And I'm going to project it outside on that side of the church. Christine, you know, I'm not sleeping now because of this, needless to say. But um, so if you have um, a piece of art, whether you made it, it's on your refrigerator, it's on your wall, it's pictures from your garden, you know, that are, is artistic and the way that you did it, photographs you took, let me know. We'll, there's a way to send them in or just talk to me. Um, if you need something photographed, let me know. We can come and make a quick shot with our camera or something. Um, nothing has to be professional. It just has to be what you have seen and called art and had in your life that you'd like everybody to see. And so we're going to have a block party um, on the 13th of May. And Linda. Okay, books, plants, and bake sale on May 21st, our second one, outdoors in the parking lot. And we had a great response last year. So uh, bring your books. We got, we got a place to store them until then. So if you've got them, bring them on over. So great time to clear off those bookshelves and make room, as we all know, for just more books is what we do, right? So uh, wonderful. All right, let's gather together and let's worship. Wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever you come with, wherever you are going, you are seen, you are heard, you are welcome, you have always belonged. For thousands of years, indigenous people have walked on this land on their own land. Their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives. We acknowledge these lands upon which we worship as the ancestral, cultural, traditional, and unceded lands of the Wabanaki Confederacy of the Indakana people. We commit ourselves to the work of dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. And let's join together in our first hymn. Please stand if you're able, a cheering, chanting, dizzy crowd. A cheering, chanting, dizzy crowd had stripped the green trees bare, and hailing Christ as King aloud, waved branches in the air. They laid their garments on the road and spread his path with palms. And vows of lasting love bestowed with royal hymns and songs. When day dimmed down to deepening dark, 
remember today is a story where people gathered and cut down leaves and branches from trees and brought out ancient words of hope that the one who comes will be one of the justice that God has promised. God, as we come here, may we lift our voices, may we offer our lives so that we may be the justice and love that God promises in this world. All this we ask in your name. Amen. If you're standing, you may be seated. We have the joy of having um, Julia with us this morning to share a poem. As a poet, I often think of myself as a gatherer, as a weaver, collecting image and story, and then myself with the spirit weaving these strands together into a poem. So this poem especially feels like a tapestry of gathered stories on my heart, stories I've heard recently of the Ukrainian woman who tucked seed, sunflower seeds into the pocket of a Russian soldier, of a friend of my family who is crossing the US-Mexico border, a Honduran family crossing for her daughters to hug her, their father again. Of the story I've heard of a woman who, by bringing a baby finch back to life, she herself came to life. And so all of these stories, thinking of just the tremendous in awe of us as humans and how this unseen power of life flows through us. So I invite you to ground into the floor and through the floor, the unseen earth below us. Find your seat and your breathing as you hear this poem, this prayer. There is no clear evidence for the resurrection. Late summer when the sunflowers bow, yellow petals curled in question, seed head burgeoned with gathered life. A next life released in rhythm with the distant melody of spring. Dark bundles of new promise imprinted with the lives before them, of the lives to come. We are created for a wild trust in the unseen, that again this small seed will grow to great heights turn its face sunward and bloom. Compelled by a horizon meadow rimmed with gold, we leave our homes and walk the desert, all to be hugged by our father again. We allow the stranded baby finch to nest within our hair. We call the phone number as our tears speak, I need help. We tuck seeds into the pockets of soldiers. We start trays of seedlings when all we see outside is frozen ground and naked branch.
Oh God of the unseen and seen. We pray that you allow us to feel the abundance of love of life that is flowing through everything. Help us to live this love with great courage, to rest in it. Amen.
Okay. <laughs> Thank <you>. choir. <laughs> All right, can I have the kids come forward? They just keep coming with this. <laughs> Hello, y'all. How are you guys? Good? It's good to see some of you back with us. I'm so glad. So why did I lay these in the aisle? Amy and I worked on it together. Why do we have palm branches in the aisle this morning? You know? Oh, you did? Why? I didn't you? Because it's Palm Sunday. Do you know what Palm Sunday is? No? Well, then I'm going to tell you. Let me get over here. I hate it when I stand on this side. What's Palm Sunday? So yes, you go to Sunday school, right? And Julie's gonna tell you the story again today, I think too. But it is a Sunday. Now, we, it, the first thing I'm gonna tell you is what next Sunday is. Next Sunday is Easter. Yeah, that's what I got. Yeah. Easter, Easter you got down cold, right. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, Palm Sunday is the Sunday before Easter and it's the start of what we call Holy Week. It's a really special week for us even though it's got some hard stories in it. So the story for today is Jesus was living in a city or around cities and stuff like that. And he was about to go into Jerusalem and Jerusalem was the big city. Like, it's like, have you been to Boston, right? Most of you guys have been to Boston and stuff like that. It'd be like us going to Boston or even New York City or something like that, right? Jerusalem was big. Everything kind of happened in Jerusalem, right? The king, well, hit one of the palaces was there for the king, like everybody lived there. And there were all different kinds of people there. And the Caesar, the guy who, kind of, who ruled over there, was like, I want all the people to behave. They can't do anything bad. Yeah. You think of it, and we'll get back to it. Oh, wonderful. It is. Oh, good. Yeah, it's a pretty one, too. Yeah, I love it. Isn't that the best when you can show your tattoos in church? We got to do that more often. Yeah, that is beautiful. It's nice. It's got pansies on it and stuff, doesn't it? Yeah, beautiful. So Jesus, so the, the Caesar is there, and he wants everybody to behave and not do anything they're not. Well, he doesn't think they're not supposed to, but he's a mean guy. He doesn't like have, he calls it peace, but it's not peace. It means only do what he wants you to do and nobody else. And he'll kill you if he, you know, and it's nasty out there. Okay. It's really nasty. And what they do is they parade around on their big horses and with their chariots and all their soldiers. And they walk down all these streets. They march down all these streets, kind of telling everybody, all right, we're stronger and bigger than you are. How does that go? How, do, how would that make you feel? sad right and afraid too right well what jesus decides to do is he decides to have another kind of parade and kind of make fun of the other parade all right and a lot of times we do this that's one thing if we're scared of something a lot of times artists and things like that help us laugh about it too and so Jesus says, so, you know, all the, the armies and everything are going to come marching in on these big, huge horses and with all this stuff. Jesus says, you know, can you go find me a baby donkey? And so they do a cult. It's called, right, of a donkey. How do you think a donkey that's never had anybody ride it before would do the first time you, like, swung your leg over and got on top of it? What do you think that donkey would do? No, it wouldn't get hurt. You know what it'd try to do? get you off right and it and they're very good at stuff like this like all they got to do is twist and turn a little bit and you're on the gra ground right so and think of like jesus was probably about my height maybe a little bit taller and donkeys aren't very big right they're not like horses right can you imagine when he got on this donkey where do you think his feet were practically on the ground it looked very silly right? And people put their cloaks down and everything. And then they start cutting down. So as he's, he's on this donkey, you know, going like this, his feet hitting the ground, you know, it's like one of those bikes that you ride when you're a kid, you know, where you, your feet kind of touch the ground. I think that's what it is. He had like a training donkey. Yeah, that's right. How you train a dragon, right? The dragons don't like it when you, um, when you get on them the first time either, right? So there he is. But everybody's like, 
this is the kind of king we want. Not one who's mean to us, not one who sends his soldiers everyone. Yep, I guess so. Okay. So, so Jesus is kind of making fun of all this and saying, what's really power? Is power being able to kill people? Is power be being able to put soldiers everywhere? No. Power is about loving people. Because what did the people, to the, when the soldiers would come through on all those parades, they would either come out of their house and go, okay, yay, they're here, because they had to, or they'd get into trouble. But with Jesus, they're like, they're taking off their coats and their cloaks, the things that protect them, and they're laying them on the ground. Can you imagine how filthy those things are going to get, right? Laying them on the ground, and they're cutting down branches, and they're saying, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Not... Um, oh, you're such a great king or anything, but, but really getting excited about it because Jesus always came in love. And that's what we have to remember too. When people try doing some things, or sometimes we do, and we think we have to be big and strong and beat people up or, or be you know, smarter than they are and stronger than they are and meaner and mean to them or something. We have to remember it's about Palm Sunday. It's about Jesus saying, no, 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 no. That's not going to work. This is going to work. And even if, you know, we've got Good Friday coming, when they kill Jesus, and they nail him on a cross, that's why we've got that cross there. Like, it's going to get bad. But Jesus said, no, love is still going to win. And that's what we're the story we're going to get a week from today on Easter, okay? So today, when we see palms like this and everything, remember that we've got another way. And sometimes we can do it with a lot of fun so that people know we love them. All right, let's pray. Gracious God, we get scared. People say they're bigger than us, that they're going to hurt us, that they could hurt us. But we know that the strongest thing in this world is your love. Let us share your love everywhere. Let us shout about it like the people did when they were waving their palm branches. Let us be your love. All this we ask in your name. Amen. All right, y'all can head. I think we've got two teachers today, too. Yay, team. today is the story of this Palm Sunday. After Jesus had told the people that had gathered around him a parable, he went on ahead, for he was going up to Jerusalem. And when he came near Bethphage and Bethany at a place called the Mount of Olives, he said two of his disciples say, go into the village ahead of you, and when you enter it, you'll find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, um, why are you untying my colt? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as they had told him. And they were untying the colt and their owners asked them, um, why are you untying our colt? And they said, the Lord needs it. And then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, the people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. And now, and he was now approaching down the path from the Mount of Olives. And the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven. Glory in the highest heaven. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, 
order your disciples to stop. And Jesus answered them, let me tell you, if these people were silent, the stones would shout out. May God bless these words to our living. This is our, the, the, our final Sunday of the Holden Prayer, uh, the beginning of our Holy Week. And so I read this one more time for us today. O oh God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending by paths yet untrodden, through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love is supporting us. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. It's our last word, the final word of this prayer today. And we often know it just as it's used today at the end of a prayer with one person saying it. And because we're all pretty much white folk, when I said, and all God's people say, y'all just sat there. Because it's also the place where voices come together and say, all God's people say, Amen. All right. And if you remember, some of you, do you, do you remember we used to sing it at the end of hymns? Do you remember we used to sing Amen? The choir probably remembers that too. But I remember when I was in seminary, there was a, which was in the, you know, the 90s, yeah, late 80s, early 90s, that there was a huge conversation about when you're supposed to sing Amen, and we were starting to leave it out, and it was this whole thing, you know, and you were supposed to sing it if there was Trinitarian language in the last verse of the hymn. That was the rule I was taught, and I'm like, oh, really? You know, um, that, and I was at that point refusing to use the male language for the Trinitary, the, Trin the Trinity. So that was a little bit of a problem for me. Now, formulaic hymn writing, which had the Trinity in, in the last verse, if you weren't going to heaven, you were going to the Trinity, is what that the hymns used to be, right? Became formulaic praise music. And instead of being sung together as a congregation, a lot of church music that's been written right, that's being written right now is for group, is not for group singing, it's for performance. And so it's become a non-issue, especially in churches that have been around for less than 30 years. You just don't hear, we don't, we don't even hear or sing amen at the end of um, hymns. I, I realized until I went to write this, I'm like, oh, we don't do that. It's like, I don't even miss it. It's too bad because four part amens at the end of hymns can be really gorgeous too. But there's a history of this, of this word, amen, too. Um, in the Jewish tradition, it's what you say when you respond to a blessing. The people say amen or amen is often how I hear it um, uh, in, in Jewish uh, circles say it. But it's when a, a blessing has been spoken that the people, it's almost like they're receiving words, amen, we'll take that, we'll take that blessing on. In Islam, you re, it's used as a reply after supplications. When you've asked, then the people say, amen, amen. In Christianity, it, it often means, so be it, let it be so, this is our truth. It's a response after things have been said or done. Amen. I actually think that word calls us to an act of faith at the end of a prayer. Or when we hear something said that we want to see in this world. I think that's what the, the, our, our Black church siblings teach us. You know, they go ahead and say it during a, a, a sermon too, right? Somebody's preaching away and you'll hear amen, right? They're in agreement and it's not just agreement. It's not just, oh, we think you said a good thing. It's a, this is how we want the world to be seen. I thought of that the other day when our soon to be new um, Supreme Court Justice, Justice Jackson was talking and I thought, where is that amen chorus for her standing with the president and the vice president? 
She spoke of her faith so eloquently and began that way. And I thought there have got to be some of her church mothers in the back row, just lifting their hands when she's saying some stuff. That they got to see some things in this world that they've been amen in for years and their mothers before them and grandmothers before that. Because amen, whether we have realized this or not, it's not just an agreement. It's a commitment. Amen. I want the world to look like this, and I am going to make it so. Jesus says amen in our story today with his whole body. He puts together a parade that shows a new way for the world to be. Jerusalem was an occupied city. Boy, saying that this year, is so different again, isn't it? You know, when people say to me, oh, how do you preach the same story every year? You know, Christmas, Easter, Palm Sunday, I say life is never the same. We've got pictures of what occupied cities look like now. We've got fear of people who are feel like they're going, they may not be fully occupied now, but they may be occupied very soon. We were occupiers and pulled out of a country and left it in ruins. Jerusalem was an occupied city. There were people in power who were full citizens, if you were a Roman citizen, and people without power. People who watched. People whose living was repressed. And the Roman government had such effective and cruel means to keep their definition of peace in place. One way they do this, of course, is they find colluders among them, among the people that they want to control. Because there's always people who are so hungry for wealth and power that they will turn on truth, they will turn on life, they will turn on love, they will turn on their own. Rome also used force and death. Slow death by people who had no choices, and also that the fear that brings on slow death to you, the fear of losing your home, your job, your property. And they were a crucifixion crew. They considered public death a good thing, a message to people. And then they had presence. They marched through the city. They quartered soldiers wherever they felt like it. And that's what brings us to this Sunday. Jesus is responding to the cries of the people from centuries. Many different kinds of oppressions by many different governments. But at his time, it was the Roman government. And he put together a parade so that people could say, amen. Not to garrisons of soldiers that were marching in and around at that time. Not to trained horses that could be above the people and could corral the people and inflict harm. Not to unsafe streets. He wanted the people to be able to say amen, which they did with their cheers to something different. And he was showing them how to make that happen. And the, the thing I never thought of before, you know, that's the thing about these stories. I know I say this every week, but I come to these stories year after year after year and go, oh my goodness, I haven't seen that before. You know, always when I talk about the people taking off their cloaks and putting them on the ground, my first thought is, oh my goodness, how dusty and dirty. You know, these days in the United States, we think, oh, how unsanitary, you know? But really, this was the people's protection. It protected you from the sun. It protected you from dust clouds. 
it, it was that the changing weather of cold at night and, and warm during the day. I was just in Arizona for a week and you have to have something, especially in, in March, you know, because you're going to need to be able to take it off or put it over your head when the sun starts shining. And at night, you're going to wrap yourself up in it. This was their protection. It could also be protection of your skin. If a soldier's by you and whaps you with something, you've at least got this layer. When they saw what Jesus was doing, they took off their protection and they put it on the ground. They were willing to voluntarily become vulnerable because they saw a new way. They prepared the way of the Lord. They weren't forced to be there. They didn't show up because their neighbors gonna, were going to report them if they didn't, that they might lose their job. They wanted to be there. This was the kind of parade they needed. And the leader, well, the leader was at the level of the people looking a bit silly. Feet on the ground, just trying to stay on this cult who couldn't figure out what was happening at this point. You know, when we were kids, I think I was told in Sunday school one year, well, the cult knew it was Jesus, so the cult didn't give Jesus any trouble. And I remember thinking, I don't know. My cat knows it's me and still scratches me, you know? The donkey didn't know what was going on. It was untrained. I suspect it stopped a lot too, you think? Especially if there were flowers around or anything that looked good it could eat. You know, what? If you're going to take me out like this, I'm just going to get a snack while I'm going. And I'm sure people at this parade could laugh, could cheer, could let their guard down. Doesn't that sound like a celebration? A life that we would want to be a part of. This parade is Jesus, amen. So be it. And let's make it happen. That desire for that kind of life, for life where people can live, where people can be de decide to be part of what's good, where we can take what we often use to protect ourselves with fear and lay it down. That is the kingdom of God. That's where we can work together and create that with God every day. That desire is contained in our amens. And Jesus also used amen, I think, in, a, in another way. I know he did. In the King James Version, remember the verily, verily, I say unto you. Remember hearing that? Um, in the New Revised uh, Standard Version, became truly, truly, I say unto you. What they're translating is, amen, amen. It means this is truth. This is truth. Jesus signaled what is coming when he used that word, amen, amen, before he even started talking, is what is coming is critical and truthful. And truth is always necessary and essential. It's, it's that on which one can build, truly build something for more than themselves. And we as people of faith, the question for us is, what is our future? And what good is faith, right? I hear this all the time. There was just a week of, for ministers and other people of what's the future of spirituality, right? And four or five people a day talk about what the future of spirituality. But we're really asking the question, what good is faith? Is it going to last? And I kept coming to, yes, yeah, somebody's got to wrestle with truth. Somebody's got to wrestle with truth. And philosophy does, or they say they do. And, but to philosophy, the truth corresponds to facts. And wouldn't that be nice if we had that in the country right now again? I'd even take that right now, that it just corresponds to facts. You see, I had to take a logic class in college. And I still, every time I say that, I say, 
it's strange that besides the philosophy majors, why was it the nursing students that were, were the only other group required to take logic? There was one male in our entire class. Why the only um, uh, major on campus that was 99% women were required to take logic? It said a lot about who they thought we were as women. But I learned from that logic class, which was so interesting, that what they did, you know, when I got in there, I thought, oh, well, you know, logic, you know, I kind of know what logic is. It's like things make sense, right? Well, it was my easiest class in college. They gave me this, this hard, um, it was on cardstock, of all the rules, kind of like rules in, in um, geometry, you know, the reflexive, you know, they use those in philosophy too. And they said, we're going to give you an opening statement, a closing statement, you have to get from A to Z just using these rules. And I thought, how is this going to be hard? In life, nobody gives you a card of rules and the rules change every time. And you actually are telling me what you want in the end. I know what life is about. People usually make statements, but they don't tell you really what they want at the end. And you have to somehow get there. And if you don't give them what they want, oh, then they're mad, even though they never told you, right? I mean, I was ready for this. How do you get from the opening statement to the final statement? What can you prove, right? As long as everybody's using the same card, we're okay. But life is not about having an identical card. We're hoping to have a few basic laws that are agreed upon. You know, we're thankful for gravity, right? Usually. Um, we have done things like the Geneva Convention for human rights but not all of those are agreed upon, are they? Even after we've done that. I listened to Katanji Brown Jackson remind us on Friday that it took 232 years and 115 prior appointments to the Supreme Court, not only for a black woman to be appointed, but for a black woman to be nominated. We have so much work to do on truth. And we saw that again and again from her hearing. Because many will use untruths, not only as we saw in her case to derail a nomination, but as I heard Anita Hill point out this week in an interview, they over-sexualized a Black woman for political reasons and political ends to denigrate her and reduce the validity, the truth of the opinions she will write going forward. Mostly will probably be dissenting opinions, but those even help shape thought. They're trying to neutralize her power and her importance, neutralize the truth that she and all the justices will bring. What do we have to do as people of faith? We have to have alternative parades. We need to do Palm Sunday stuff a lot. We need to figure out what our amen is and say, this is truth, this is truth. This is the truth I will live out. Remember later in this week, and if you're with us on Thursday night as we gather here first to do um, uh, the, uh, the Last Supper, but then here to do the story of Good Friday, Pilate will ask the question, what is truth? Pilate doesn't even know how to approach this. The powers that be that can march through a city days later are going to say, we don't even know truth. That's not our job. Pilate is struggling. And he asks Jesus for help. Can you imagine that? Think about that. He's standing in judgment of Jesus. And he says, you know, you who I'm probably going to have to, to murder, right? execute. Could you help me with this before you go, before I do you in? When the Pharisees, 
who institutionally are supposed to be the people calling out the truth, helping the people to wrestle with truth and instead want the truth silenced. They hear the truth. They hear people shouting out these ancient words. They're so old, these words are. And they say, teacher, tell your people to shut their mouths. You can hear what their job really is, is to control rather than release. To cover rather than foster the truth. And Jesus says, I tell you, Amen, amen, amen. If these people were silent, the stones would shout out. We are people of faith. We don't just respond truth to truth. We signal truth and we create truth. We create parades of truth that, at, that ask people and invite people to take off their fear and their protection and not use it for power, but to create life. Even just a moment of life will take. Where together we can shout out and be joyful. We don't need donkeys or street permits or even palm trees. We have our lives who we are, and we have God's presence. Amen. Blessed are those when we come in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us be the amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, it is, it seems, a never-ending parade of words that end life, of words that rob people of life, of words that say, life, life, but we hear it echo, death, death. God, let us raise our voices, let us gather together let us laugh and make fun of the fear so that we can be strong in your love. All this we ask in your name. Amen. And let's stand together and let's practice our amens. So the song that we have, um, your job is the amen, 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 amen. Allie's going to sing something. We're going to come in just as she finishes each time, all right? Do you, do you all know this with the verses? Yeah. Um, all right. Okay. <laughs> all right. Let's sing it. <laughs>
may be seated. What we can do is gather. What we can do is whenever we see a place that needs truth is to speak up and to act. Whenever we see a place, a person who thinks their words are not heard, their person is not seen, we can hear and we can see. And we do that together in so many ways. So we gather our gifts together, our truth, our amen, so that we can be God's people. Let's gather together and give. God, for all that we gather together, whether we do it with the strength of our convictions or in the hope, even as we know fear, God, you are with us and you send us out. Send us with these gifts as your people. All this we ask in your name. Amen. If you're standing, you may be seated. And let's gather together in our time, of prayer together. If you'll join me using the bold type that's in your bulletin. It took courage to ask for a donkey that was not yours, to use the words of power and subvert the power. God of courage, may we ask for what we have been told is not the world's. May we demand peace, hope, justice, love. God of subversive power, Forgive us when we don't believe in the power of your love. Forgive us when we are afraid to be unpopular, afraid of the judging glare that demands conformity. God of action, forgive us for thinking that you are sitting and waiting. Open our eyes to subversive actions that you inspire people, that you have put in front of us to do. God of courageous faith and subversive action, forgive us for silencing ourselves and others to keep the peace. God of courageous faith and subversive action, open our ears to the stones crying out. Make our voices rock hard with the words of justice. Loving God, we come to you as people who have voices, as people who have big voices, we are people of so much privilege in this world, unearned. There is no reason for us to have these big voices. But God, as we wrestle with what that means and how to create inequality in this world, God, let us not be afraid to use them for you. Let us not be afraid to use them for justice in this world. Let us quiet our voices to God so that those who are crying out from their places of pain can be heard. God, we are not silent stones. We have words of love and justice and kindness and peace. God, in the words that we speak, may our words be filled with just those things. Help us take from our vocabulary the words of division and hate. The words that speak to a world without hope. 
And let us be filled instead with your words of hope. God, we come as your people here this morning with things on our hearts, things that we speak about, things that we keep silent. God, we offer them all to you, for you know them. There is nothing that we can keep or hide from you. Forgive us for thinking that we can. Teach us as we find those words, as we speak those words, as we open our hearts. Teach us how big the world is. Teach us how strong your love is. Teach us how strong we can be in your love. God, we pray for those who we've given positions of what we call power. May they know that their power comes from justice and truth, not from obscuring both. We pray this morning, God, for our transgender siblings, whether they be young or old, who are so frightened right now, who are being called out in the content of laws, are being, who are being excluded, and who people find pride in themselves for having done this work. God, forgive us. Let us make parades that celebrate and support. Let us do that not just once a year in a month, but every day. Let us pray against hate and injustice. God, for those who are afraid this morning, who hear that we're recovering now out of COVID, but they still can't feed their families. They don't know how they will afford rent. They don't know what job will be somewhere where they can earn and offer to the world their skills and their time. God, because we think our place is reasonably secure, remind us, God, that that doesn't mean our work is done. Let us march and shout so that others may truly live. for our siblings in Ukraine, for whom this bit of a lull just mean that, that the ravages and the terror of war is even more apparent. God, for all those looking for loved ones, burying loved ones, mourning loved ones. God, may our hearts break so that peace may flow out, so that it may come to all in this world. For the Russian soldiers who have been asked to kill those who they called brothers or neighbors, who realize they speak same, the same language, that they look like their siblings or their parents. God, may they lay down their weapons of war. May they hear this story today of this alternative parade and may they make a new parade of peace. May the leaders of this world 
hear this story or their own story in their tradition of peace and hear it as a call to them. God, may their hearts of stone break, break open and may they find their voices in praising you. Loving God, for all among us who seek your presence, your healing presence, your loving presence, your accepting presence, for those who seek healing in body and mind and spirit, for our beloveds who are in recovery and those for whom recovery is still a path they have not yet found. God, may they know your presence. For those who struggle silently, quietly, God, may we hear them even in their silence and their quiet. May they know your presence through our care. And God, send us into this week now, this week of hard stories, but stories that we need. Remind us of your life, even in the midst of death. And hear us now as we gather our voices together and teach us through this prayer that we pray. Eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, parent of us all, loving God in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echo through the universe, the way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world, your heavenly will be done by all created beings, your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. And let's join together in our final hymn, a new hymn and song I found, but I just love the words for this day. My Lord is a donkey riding man.
praises will you, you will go, in the amens that you will speak, in the praise that you will begin, God's peace will be with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>